Good afternoon and welcome to this NEH webinar. We're very glad that you've joined us this afternoon uh, for this presentation about the NEH Summer Stipends Program. Uh, we're going to get started just now. We'll start quickly with a couple of introductions. I am Dan Sack, a program officer at the NEH. I've been at the NEH about 10 years. Um, my background is in the history of American religion, uh, was at the University of Chicago before coming to the NEH. I'm joined here today by my colleague Gwen Yates. I'll bring her up here just now. She can introduce herself. Gwen? Hello, I'm Gwen Yates. I'm the program analyst for the for the Summer Cypress program, and I've been with the agency since 2006. And welcome. Good, thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you so much. All righty, I will go back to the slides here just now, um, and we will uh, talk for about 20, 25 minutes, and then there'll be time at the end of the day for questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and so it'll be able to be watched later on. Also note that closed captioning is available, and so if you um, click at the box in the lower right-hand corner, you can open the closed captions. Up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a box labeled Q&A. This is a place for you to type in questions. At the end of our presentation, we'll have, I hope, about a half an hour or so to respond to questions. And so I ask you to type in your questions as you have them there. This is the, here's our agenda for the day. I'm gonna give a quick overview for the Summer Stipends Program and provide some key program details. I'll talk a little bit about eligibility and the nomination process. We'll talk about the review criteria and what's involved in applying. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. Before I, we go into all that, a quick note. Since the endowment is a federal agency, you may assume that the staff are all federal bureaucrats. Well, we are, but the endowment staff are also scholars, many of us with faculty experience and research records. We see our job as supporting public and scholarly engagement with the humanities, and we do it because we believe in the humanities and in scholarship. If you take away nothing else from today's discussion, know that unlike many foundations, NEH staff are ready to talk to you by phone or email. We want to be your allies. The Summer Stipends Program is one of the oldest programs at the NEH. It hasn't changed much over the years, but here, here are a few shifts you might want to know something about. In past years, the, the program was governed by something we called the guidelines. Those documents are now called the Notice of Funding Opportunities, or NOFO for short. They contain the same basic information but arranged a little bit differently. So if you're looking for information, look to those NOFOs. And I'll, today I'll give you some page citations for those. They're all cited on our webpage. We revised the evaluation criteria a bit this year. I'll discuss that in, in a few moments. They're the same criteria, just organized a little bit differently. As you're working on your application, you should pay close, close attention to those criteria. The application package now includes a new form, the Project Performance Site Location Form. It's very simple, just you'll tell us where, where you're gonna be working during your research. And finally, just be aware that we have a new cross-agency initiative called a More Perfect Union. As the US approaches its 250th anniversary in 2026, the NEH encourages projects that promote a deeper understanding of American history and culture and then advance civic education and knowledge of our core principles of government. The agency-wide and more perfect union initiative will help Americans better understand the world's oldest constitutional democracy and how our founding ideals are met in a modern pluralistic society. Projects do not need to respond to that initiative. If your project is unrelated, you do not need to refer to it whatsoever. You will not get a boost if you refer to it and you will not get a demerit if you don't and all applications will be evaluated in the usual criteria. The main goal of Summer Stipends Program is to support outstanding and advanced humanities research in all disciplines and fields. These projects can be valuable to scholars, general re readers, or both. The program supports pro projects at any stage of development, early, middle, or late, although these small grants are often most useful at the early research stage or at the end of a writing, the writing process. Here's the most important details. Summer stipends grants are for two months, usually although not necessarily during the summertime. The grant period must be full-time and must be continuous. 
the grant is for $6,000. The application deadline this year is September 23rd, 2020. Notifications will be made in late March 2021. Work can start as early as May 1st and conclude as late as September 1st, 2022. Over the last five years, the summer stipends program has re received an average of 826 app 827 applications and made an average of 81 awards per year for an average funding rate of about 10%. Do not let these numbers discourage you. It is a competitive program, but you can't get a grant unless you apply. If you don't get an award the first time around, we encourage you to reapply and then reapply. I will also note that 40% of the awardees in the last five years were first time applicants to the NEH. With these summer stipends, people do what all scholars do. They research and they write. The most common outcome of a summer stipend award is a book or a monograph, but we are seeing other types of products as well, including eBooks and digital materials, peer reviewed articles and other, and, uh, and other things. Translations and editions with critical apparatus are fully eligible in this program. Here are a few recent books supported by the summer stipends grants. They're just illustrations. They're just meant to show the variety of projects that receive grants. We receive, we welcome projects on all topics in the humanities. The Summer Stipends Program is open to all disciplines in the humanities. We invite all disciplines, individuals from all institutions, and especially welcome independent scholars and junior scholars, as well as faculty at historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and community colleges. Here's how we define the humanities as laid out in our founding legislation. So it runs the gamut, it's really quite broad. The summer stipends program is open to all disciplines in the humanities, but also to projects from the social sciences and, and sciences that include, include, employ humanistic methods. All U.S. citizens and foreign nationals who have lived, lived in the U.S. for at least three years up before the deadline are eligible to apply. There's no advanced degrees required. No institutional affiliation is required. However, you are not eligible if you are an currently enrolled in a degree program. If you are currently enrolled, you have to show us that you will have satisfied all the requirements for the degree by the application deadline, September 23rd, and have a letter from your department chairman or dean telling us that. The summer stipends program is unique at the NEH in requiring that all tenured and tenured track faculty need to be nominated by their institution. Each institution can nominate up to two people per year. We do this to encourage applications from a broad range of institutions and to encourage faculty to discuss their research with each other. Institutions run their own nomination process and identify one person as the nominating official on campus. Applicants include that person's name in their applications so we can contact, contact them to confirm the nomination. Note that a big group of people are exempt from nomination. Non-tenure track faculty, including adjuncts, non-faculty staff, community college faculty, emeritus and emerita faculty and independent scholars. All those people are exempt from, from the nomination requirements. It's also important to note that the kinds of things that our program does not support. You'll find a full list on page 14 of the Notice of Funding Opportunities, but note that the list includes artistic projects, advocacy and policy work, teaching materials, empirical social science projects without humanities content and dissertations. Applicants submit their own applications, even if they're nominated by their institutions. They submit their application package through a portal called grants.gov, which I'll describe at the end of this presentation. Here's what the application package includes. And again, you'll find all this information in the NOFO on pages five through 13. Most important is a three page narrative. I'll say more about the narrative in a moment. There should be a one-page bibliography that demonstrates your knowledge of the field. 
you reviewers will know that the bibliography is not meant to be comprehensive. The same goes for the two page re resume. In the resume or CV, you should focus on the items that are most relevant to your current project and best demonstrate your competencies for that work. For certain kinds of projects, you'll need a one page appendix. So this would include an, an addition or translation project, a database or something that involves visual materials. If you're not doing any of these things, you should not include an appendix. If you're a doctoral student who's waiting for a conferral of degree, you should have a letter documenting that. If you have some form of federal debt that you're delinquent on, you'll need to document that as well. The application forms also ask for a few more things. A brief summary of your project, less than a thousand characters, which will be the first thing your evaluators see. Also, the names and addresses of two people who can write recommendation letters for your application. Ideally, they'll come from two different institutions, different from your own, and from people who know your project well. Note that missing letters do not make your project ineligible, but it is more helpful to have them. Recommenders, recommendation letters are due to us by September 16th. We'll request them once your application is processed. Note that the Summer Stipend Award is a fixed amount of money, and so no budget is required for these grants. On page 10 of the guidelines, you'll find an explanation of the parts that should be in your narrative. Number one, the significance and contribution of your research. Why is the project important? Number two, the organization and methods of your project. How will you do it? Number three, a work plan. What will you do during the grant period and how does it fit into the larger arc of your project? Number four, your competencies, skills, and access for the project. Why are you the right person to do this work? Finally, number five, the final product and dissemination. How will your work reach its audience? Bear in mind that to do all this in three pages. You'll find the five criteria on page 15 of the NOFO. I will now go through these for just a moment. The first criterion is the most important. Briefly, why? Tell your reader what your project is about and why it is important. You should explain what will contribute to your specific field in a way that a journalist can understand. You should also situate your project in the broader context of humanities research and knowledge. How will your project change the scholarship? Who needs to read your book and why? How will your book change the way they understand the topic? And does your work tell us anything beyond larger? The second criterion is about what? What will you do during the grant period? It needs to explain to general readers what you will do and convince them that the work will answer your research questions. It needs to be clear and organized. A well-written, clear application is a predictor of the quality of the planned publication, so a clear narrative is important. The third criterion is about how. How will your project work? You should provide a detailed work plan describing what you will do each month. Be realistic about how much work you can get done during the grant period. Be specific. I'm going to work on chapter three. I will go to this archive. Think about where you're going to be in your project's arc when the award period starts, even though that may be nine months away or more from your application date. The fourth criterion is about who. Why are you the perfect person to do this project? Emphasize your strengths, exceptional language abilities that the project requires, or research skills that make the projects work. Evaluators will also look at your CV to see your research and publication experience. They will, of course, understand that people at different career stages will have different levels of experience. The final criterion is about the likelihood of success. You need to convince your readers that you will be able to finish the project, not necessarily during the grant period, and it will reach the audiences you've identified. Evaluators will look at your publication record and referee letters to decide whether they have confidence in your ability to produce. As I mentioned, you will submit your application through a portal called grants.gov. In addition to the narrative, it will ask you to fill out a few other forms. This is all described in pages six through eight in the NOFO. 
There's a form called SF-424, which is a general federal form, which asks for your name, your contact information, um, your congressional district and mailing address. The project information will ask for the title of your project. Please make it something the general public will understand. And for a thousand character long description of your project. This is basically the abstract for your project. There's also the NEH Supplemental Information Form, which asks for a couple more important things. The field of your project and your field. We use, these are disciplinary fields. We use these to sort out applications to the proper review fields. It will also ask for your status as junior or senior scholar. Senior scholar is more than seven years out from a uh, terminal degree. It will ask for the names and email addresses and, and affiliations of your references. Please give us only one email address. It will also ask for the name and email address of the nominating official. So if you're a tenured or tenure track person, please give us the name and contact of the person on campus who can not confirm your nomination. We will contact them in October to, for that. Also in there is a project, for, project and performance site location form, a new and very simple form. Simply tell us where you'll be doing your work during the grant period. Finally, there's an attachments form where you can add your narrative, bibliography, CV, and any appendices. As mentioned, you'll submit your own application through grants.gov. Your, your institution will not submit it. Rather, you will submit it. You will need to register for that, and will that takes a little bit of time. All federal applications have to go through this portal. If you're applying as an individual, make sure your account has an individual applicant profile. Otherwise, you won't be allowed to apply. You should note that over 50% of our applications are submitted the last day, and sometimes the system crashes. I recommend that you submit at least several days before the application deadline to make sure there's no technical problems. If you've realized you made a mistake somewhere along the way and you need to resubmit before the application due date, we will lose, use your last validated online submission. If you do have application problems, please call the grants.gov helpline. They are actually helpful. You'll find the number here and also in our guidelines. I've given you a lot of information here. I'm sorry it's been overwhelming, but all's not lost. There are lots of resources for you as you work on your application. On our website, and there is the link there, you'll find a link for the NOFO document, which includes detailed instructions for how to apply. You will also find some sample application narratives. This will show you how somebody else made a case for their project. You will also find a link of recently funded projects, which shows the breadth of the kinds of things the program can fund. You will also find there a recording of this webinar in case you want to look at the slides again. I will also post there a PDF of the slides themselves in case you want to share them with colleagues. Also remember, please, you can contact us. Your best bet is to drop us a line at stipends at neh.gov. You'll hear back from one of us as soon as possible. Finally, we, around September 1st, we will post another webinar with suggestions on writing a good stipends application. We're almost ready to take your questions. Um, go to the top, top right hand corner of your screen and find there the box for the Q&A section. Type in your questions and we'll take as many as, as we can in, 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 until three o'clock. While you think about your questions, here are a few frequently asked questions and answers. Are dissertation revisions eligible? Absolutely. But projects based on dissertations need to demonstrate how their projects move beyond the original dissertation. Can you apply for a collaborative project? Yes, kind of. The summer stipends program is designed for individual applicants. If you're working on a collaborative project, each collaborator must submit an individual application. An award may not be divided among in, in multiple collaborators. The peer reviewers will be asked to evaluate each application on its own merits. Each application should clearly explain how the work will be divided and the extent to which each collaborator's contribution depends on that of the others. 
applicants who are seeking funding only for themselves, but who are working as part of a collabor collaborative team are also eligible. If you're doing a bigger project, collaborating scholars working with an eligible institution, you may want to apply to the NEH's collaborative research program. Can you apply concurrently to other NEH programs? Yes, you can apply to most other NEH programs all at the same time, including the Public Scholars Program and the Fellowships Program, but you can only hold one grant in a given federal fiscal year. That means if you apply for a fellowship and then for a summer stipend and receive the fellowship, we will withdraw the summer stipend application. Who submits the application? You do, the applicant does. So even if you are a nominee of an institution, you should be submitting your own application. And all notifications will go to the email provided to the, in the application. Now we have some time, time for questions. Okay. I currently serve on a board, I currently serve as a board member for my state's humanities organizations. Does this make me ineligible for a summer stipend? Um, no, it does not. Um, that does not affect your qualification. Um, the only issue would be conflict of interest issues, and that does not sound like a conflict of all. So that's um, that does not affect you at all. Can you have a summer stipend more than once in your career? Absolutely. Um, you are eligible for more than one. Um, if you are applying for a summer stipend for the same project that you've gotten a, a grant for in the past, you need, however, to explain what you did with that previous grant and how this new stipend would build on that. Do you know how many stipends go to junior first book versus senior scholars like a general proportion? Um, the numbers vary year to year. Um, last year, I think we had roughly half and half applications junior versus senior. And about two thirds of the applications total went to seniors. So seniors have a slight advantage over juniors in that sense. Um, that's largely because they have a bit more experience in writing applications and in and a publication publication record. That does not mean, however, that juniors should not apply, and we're really encouraging junior scholars to apply. As I said at the beginning, 40% of uh, stipends awardees in the last five years, that was their first application to the NEH. Can TT faculty who are not US citizens or who are not green card holders apply for NEH funding? Yes. So you can apply to the NEH as if you're non citizens can apply to the NEH as long as they've been in the US continuously for at least three years before the deadline or had a residence in the US for at least three years before the deadline, which is the end of September. Um, so obviously traveling out of the country briefly is an issue, but as long as you've been resident for at least three years, non citizens are eligible. Are projects about non-US topics in any way not a priority? Uh, projects on all topics are welcome and non-US topics are certainly welcome and encouraged. Are contingent adjunct non-tenured faculty encouraged to apply? Absolutely. We very much li um, li like to see people out of the non-tenure track um, setting. Um, they are frequently awardees, um, lots of postdocs, independent scholars, etc. Uh, often awards are made to people in, in, in those cohorts. My research requires archival trips, but of course it is hard to predict now that will be open, whether travel will be possible because of COVID-19. How do you recommend people like me deal with this in the application? That's a very good question. Um, so I'll tell you that this, this current year, um, when we got uh, we processed applications over the winter and we're going to be awarding them in the, the spring. As soon as the awards were made, it was very hard for uh, people had to change their plans. We were very, very flexible. The agency was very active in allowing people to change their plans um, and or and or to postpone their grants. So I would encourage you 
to apply, submit an application for the work that you want to do. Assume that you're able to travel. Uh, if the award is made and you need to change your plans, we can work with you on that. Can you say more about the stipend support article writing as I am in the field that tends to publish work and articles more frequently than books? Yeah, and we've been seeing more of that and um, talk in your application about dissemination and why an article is the right way to disseminate. And so, um, you know, say in my field, uh, articles are the most common way to do it. And these are the kinds of journals I would imagine publishing in. Um, so explain your dissemination plan and why in your field this is the right way to do it. Should recommenders be experts in the research area of the applicant? Yes, so the best reference letters are people who can talk about the importance of the project. Um, so the person who can say, I know this field well, and this project is gonna be important for this reason, this is how it's gonna change the field. Talk more about that than about you. So the best reference letters is not necessarily your graduate advisor, but rather somebody who knows the field and can talk about the field. If you are no longer going to be with your institution at the conclusion of this upcoming year, my position is being eliminated due to budget cuts. Do you still need to be nominated through your institution? I am a tenure track, but do not know if I will be in a similar position during the summer of 2021. Um, I would encourage you to talk to your administrators on campus about the nomination process, but then also in the fall before you submit the application, drop me a line and my email address is there on the screen and just explain the situation where things currently stand um, and we'll talk about it and figure out how best to handle it at that point. Could we apply for more than one NEH grant during the same academic year for the same project? Yes, you can. You just can't hold them in the same in the same fiscal year. The federal fiscal year runs October 1st to September 30th, and you cannot hold more than one research grant during that grant period. But you can certainly apply um, and then figure out how you want to um, which one you want to accept. I am a postdoctoral fellow being renewed for another three year contract and would like to apply for a research project on which I am working if I am eligible. I consulted the NOFO but wanted to check in with you to be sure. Would this postdoc fellow be eligible to apply outside of the faculty nomination process? Yes, it sounds like a, post, a postdoc person is not tenure track and so therefore they do not need to go through the nomination process. They are exempt from exempt from nomination. If a project is comparative by nature, but should still be reviewed by experts in a specific national tradition, should the applicant list it as a national filed or as comparative project? That's a really good question. And you should think about that strategically. Um, determine where you think your project makes the best and most important contribution, and then identify that as the key field for the project, and we will then aim to get your application to reviewers in that field. However, if it's a comparative project, you might get, use your two reference letters, recognizing that, and say, uh, one reference letter is from an expert in the one field, the other reference letter is for the expert in the other field, which then allows to make, you know, allow those two, those two letters to make that comparative argument. But yes, if um, think about where you make your best contribution and then focus your application in that field. What are the restrictions on letters of recommendation? As long as they are from a separate institution from where you are, can they come from the same place or do they need to come from scholars at two different institutions? 
Um, they can really come from anywhere. Um, as I said, the most important is people who know the field and know the importance of your project to the field. I think the reviewers would be most convinced, however, by people at different institutions simply because that shows that your application is, that your work is being read by people out, outside your institution. Um, so that the reference, choice of reference letters helps to demonstrate the breadth of the value of your project. I am a third year tenure track faculty member, but I've held my PhD since 2013. Would I be considered a senior scholar? I think congratulations, you are now a senior scholar because by the application deadline, you will be seven years or more post, post PhD. And, and the junior senior in, in distinction, by the way, only makes sense because we keep track of it. It does not affect at all the review does not affect whether or not how successful your application will be. It just helps us keep track of where applications are coming from. Do you accept draft applications or, or deadline for draft applications? I notice other NEH grants may have this one as an option for applicants. Unfortunately, we cannot read drafts for this program because we get so many applications. We just couldn't read all the drafts. Um, but um, we are absolutely happy to answer questions. Um, so if you have questions about the program, please drop us a line. Um, we're happy to answer them, but unfortunately we cannot read drafts. If I am expanding my dissertation, should I make that clear in my narrative and explain what's new or how I plan to move it forward? Absolutely, do that. Say this was a dissertation, but for this next stage of the process, I'm going to add another chapter or uh, do some additional research or some of the sort. So absolutely what you say is what you should be doing. Do reviewers privilege references from full tenure professors more than pre-tenure re references? Um, my experience is that reviewers are looking to reference letters not for their own qualifications, but rather for their knowledge of the field and their ability to say something important about the project. So if you have a choice between a big name person who has general knowledge of the field or a more junior scholar who can speak really, really thoughtfully and creatively about the project and the importance of the project, absolutely opt for that second person. I like to write a historical novel. I'm in the early stages of research. Is this a project that would hold weight against other more scholarly projects? Unfortunately, um, that would fiction projects, no matter how historical, um, are not allowed from this program because that is we view that as creative writing as opposed to scholarship. Can reviewers be in the industry or do they need to be at an academic institution? A reference letters could certainly be in a relevant field outside academia as long as they could talk about the importance of the project um, to the audiences identified for the project. Will the questions on this Q&A be available in writing or will it be just on the recording or, or for later reference? Um, I know it will be on the recording. I think we may be able to make the um, transcript available. I'm hoping we will. We, and if so, we will post that on the Summers Taipans page along with the recording. Am I still eligible to apply if I teach at a seminary? Absolutely. I have a seminary background myself, and so I know that field well. Seminary faculty are indeed eligible. Should the letter writers be from a humanities field or can they be from a discipline like engineering or environmental sciences? for work in environmental humanities? Um, yes, they can be from those fields. Ideally, however, they should be able to talk about the importance of the project for the humanities. Um, that's, after all, what we're trying to fund. And so being able to do that is going to be really important for your project. 
What tips do you have for those on committee deciding on who to nominate? That's a really good question. Um, we leave the nomination process up to each institution to determine their, their process. Um, ideally, we like to see committees rather than just an individual make the choice. Um, I would suggest that you use the same criteria that the reviewers use. Um, and I, I sh showed them earlier in this presentation and they're in the NOFO document. So go back and take a look at those and use those to help you figure out how sort of assess where you see the strongest applications. Um, you may, however, as institutions say, we want to give preference to junior faculty, um, and we would certainly understand that. But I think the criteria are where you ought to start. If I'm in the process of writing my first book, but will likely begin research on a second book project next summer, which project would you recommend I write the grant for? Should I write my grant for what I believe is the more appealing topic? Um, well, obviously you want to talk about the what you're going to be, the pro, you want to write the proposal about what you're going to be doing during the grant period. So if during the grant period you're finishing up the first book, you're going to write that proposal. If during the grant period you're working the second one, write that out. So really, you want to be during the grant period working on one project, and you want to be talking about that project in the proposal. In my scholarly publication record, there have been some gaps in publication, never more than two years, because of the heavy service work I have to do. Will this be held against my application? Um, I don't think so. Um, my experience is that our reviewers understand that um, and they will look at your CV and say, OK, there are some gaps in publication, but I know that's a teaching heavy institution and I think that person has done a pretty great job in being productive during the um, with the time that they've got. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I mean, you might include a sentence that said in the application that says, um, you know, I'm in a teaching heavy institution, but I've been able to do this public this writing publication, which is available in my CV. Please clarify the details about the September 1 application writing webinar. I'm sorry, that's a repeated question. Uh, let me right. go back down. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think I answered that one. Um, so we will on September 1st be posting a recorded webinar which will share application writing tips, um, some of which we've done here today, but some other things that will also be helpful. Um, and so that will be available then, which will be about three weeks before the application deadline. If my project is truly comparative and crossing multiple fields, can my recommender only talk about one aspect of the project in the specific field they are familiar with? Um, they should write whatever they feel they're capable of writing. The more, the broader, obviously, they can assess an application, the better. So they may say, based on my field, I see this, but I also know a little bit about this other field that's going to be helpful to this as well. Um, the letter writer is going to be very, very helpful to you if you're doing a comparative project um, because the peer reviewers may know mainly about the one field the reference letter is going to be helpful in helping them understand the other fields as well. Does the application require an itemized budget narrative? It does not. The Summer Stipends Award is a flat $6,000, and you can use that money for whatever you need to do, whether it be travel, buying yourself out of, uh, out of teaching time, whatever. So no budget is required. It's a flat $6,000. Is there a way to access the writing tips webinar earlier? My institution internal deadline is mid-August. Um, we have not yet recorded it. Um, I will try to record it before then and get it posted sooner. What if you are at 
and R1, but have been tenured 3-3 or 3-2 faculty member for 15 years. Service requirements vary within R1 institutions. So I think this is a question about um, teaching and service load versus research. Um, and I think in your narrative, you can say um, I'm at this institution, um, but because of a heavy in teaching and, and service load, my re my research productivity has been this. And I think a simple sentence like that would be quite sufficient. Um, your, your, your goal there is not to um, justify yourself, but simply just to clarify, um, clarify your career to your readers. Where is the link to view previous grantees proposals? So that is on the NEH um, website. Um, and I'm going to see if I can um, go back to the page that has that. Um, so hope that you can see that page that has all the important information on this on this program. So it includes the guidelines, the samples, and will include ultimately the recording of this webinar. Can you reapply for the same project that was previously denied after seeing the comments from the reviewers? Absolutely, and we encourage that. You don't need to explain this is a new application. Every application is new. So you don't need to say, last time you turned me down, but this is different this way. It's going to be going to totally different reviewers. Just simply read the comments from the previous evaluators and talk about what you're going to do during this grant, new grant period. Um, our experience is, and I don't have solid numbers on this, but our experience is, is that reapplications are more likely to be successful in part because they've seen the comments from previous reviewers, but also, of course, because a project has moved forward. Um, and so um, I think that will make for a stronger application. If we have recycled, if we have requested notes from the previous cycle, how long will it take to receive feedback? Um, so we aim to get comments out from um, the previous cycle within about two months. Um, that was take a little bit of staff time. Gwen, you know this, you do all you do all that work, um, but it takes about two months ideally. If you have not received them, um, please drop us a line at stipends at neh.gov and we will find out uh, what the situation there is. That is correct. We get over 600 requests, so they take a little bit of time. Uh, it's another question is, may we ask questions of NEH staff about the appropriateness of a topic for this program? Absolutely, I'd be very happy to talk with you about that. Um, and we can even talk strategically about how you might frame the project um, and identify it for the right panels. Does a naturalized citizen need to be living in the US at the time of application? Um, as long as you are a citizen, you don't need to be living in the U.S. So it's either a citizen either in the, in the U.S. or abroad or a non-citizen who has lived in the U.S. for at least three years. Can funds be used to support travel to archives outside of the U.S.? The project is U.S. based. Absolutely. You can you can use the funds for whatever you need to do that furthers the project. And wherever those archives are, whatever that travel requires, absolutely. Does the sample narratives encompass all of the fields apl applicable for this grant? There are about four or five of them that I forgot now what the fields are. Um, so they're illustrative. Um, they're certainly not exhaustive, but they're illustrative. So um, um, take a look there and see if there's something that's really close to your field. If not, if you have other questions, drop us a line. We'll answer them as best we can. How many reviewers read each application? So our review panelists, review panels include three people. Um, they are organized into roughly disciplinary areas and they read about 25 to 30 applications. Um, and so we have that means about 
four or so U.S. history applications and a Latin American studies, uh, four, th 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 three or four American history panels and two American lit panels and, you know, a medieval studies panel. It really varies the numbers of applications we get each year, how they get clustered, but each application is read by three people. Let's see, will the award be paid to the individual affiliated institution or is it preference? of the applicant? It goes to the applicant in, in, in direct deposit. Are you seeking re volunteers for review panels? We are always happy to have volunteers for review panels. And so if you would like to be a panelist, drop me a line. I will put you on our list of prospective people. Uh, we're always looking for more reviewers. Um, and I will say that serving as a panelist is a good way to learn how the system works and a good way to learn to will help you write a better application yourself. Are there are the boundaries for utilization of grant money? Sorry if this has been asked, but are there boundaries? <laughs> um, so I think that probably means are there allowable costs? Um, and it's not really an issue for this program again because it's a flat amount of money that goes to you to support your project. Um, and so um, as long as what you are doing um, fulfills the goals of your project, um, it is not an um, issue of allowable costs is not an issue here. If you are doing an in 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 interdisciplinary project, will your application be read by multiple panels? It will only go to one panel in the discipline that seems to be the best possible fit. So that means if you're doing an interdisciplinary project, you might think strategically, identify where you feel your project makes the best possible contribution, and then write your application for that field, and then say, oh, and this other field is also useful as well. Um, and then when you submit the application in that supplemental information form, you identify the fields of your project, and that's where you can tell us where you feel your project makes the most important contribution. Does the field of education fit into the umbrella of humanities according to NEH? It does as long as it's a humanistic take on education. So uh, particularly sort of history or sociology of education is certainly eligible. Um, Educational policy studies are outside the remit of this program, but some education projects are. Um, why don't you drop me a line and we'll talk about the specifics of your project. Does women's studies and cultural studies included in the humanities? Absolutely. Um, we tend not to have panels on those fields. They tend to end up in more um, geographic places, so those projects might go to American studies or American history or Latin American studies or whatever, but those kinds of projects are abs absolutely eligible. Where can we find a list of specific review fields for the grant? How many are there? Um, when you put your application together, one of the forms in the grants.gov application package is called Supplemental NEH Application Form. And there's a there are drop down menus in there with the disciplinary fields in there, and there's a lot of them, so I can't give you the list, but that's where you'll see that, um, and you can choose up to three fields for your project and one for yourself. I'm starting work as the editor of a collection in which I also will contribute one of the essays. Is an edited collection a viable project? Um, if you're looking for support for yourself, absolutely. Um, you should talk about what you'll do during the grant period um, and show how the success of your work will not necessarily be limited by other people's role. Um, we want to make sure that the effectiveness of your grant is not negatively affected by somebody else's inability to do their work. So talk about what you're going to do during the grant period and show how it's going to be independent of what other people are doing. 
Is there a reporting requirement? Yes, three months after the end of the grant period, you'll be required to submit a short report. Um, it is an online, uh, it's an online form with you to fill in some boxes to describe what you did, what you did during the grant period, and uh, what you learned. Um, so it's a fairly straightforward report, but those are due about three years at three, excuse me, three months after the grant period. Do review panels consist of new panelists each year, or do panelists serve in consecutive years? Every panel is new, so um, you cannot be on a panel more than I think every three to five years. So every panel is new. Do you accept applications from management field? Um, potentially, yes, if you can talk about it as a humanities project. Um, and so that um, I think my sort of rule of thumb on this is. Would your project be interesting and important to people in the humanities? So would you imagine this to be interesting to a colleague in, say, history or ethics or a social science, for instance? Um, and if you have, want to talk more about that, drop me a line and we'll discuss it. Do you fund stints of qualitative fieldwork in cultural anthropology? Um, most of our social science projects are qualitative rather than quantitative. Um, if you are doing quantitative work but are doing humanistic interpretation of that, it is potentially eligible. Um, Again, drop me a line and we can discuss this further if you'd like. Can the 6,000 support two months of writing at home with only minimal travel? Absolutely. So um, it can support research travel, writing at home, or some combination of those things. What are the panels? Are they listed somewhere? Um, we it varies year to year depending on the applications that we get. Um, they tend to cluster around the fields that are in that um, supplemental form I mentioned, um, but there is no published list of them. Uh, it really depends once the applications come in uh, and we sort the applications out, we then put them in clusters depending on um, the numbers of applications we get. And so, you know, there's always a um, several American history panels. There's always an American lit panel, um, but it really varies year to year precisely which which panels we have. Should I emphasize my publication record more than teaching experience in my second page CV? Yes, yeah, so the two page CV really focus on your research and your and your publication because that's really what the reviewer is going to be looking for. Does a monograph project that is under contract by a publisher have an advantage over one that is not? Um, a contract is not required, but it certainly helps. Um, so if you have a contract, please talk about that. If you don't have a contract, it'd be helpful to talk about how you would picture the project getting published at some point. Maybe you've talked to an editor, maybe you have an idea of what public, what press you want to go to, but um, the um, but a, a contract is not required. If one if one's project is in literary cultural studies across two different area studies, Africa, Asia, would it be reviewed in an area studies context or the literary studies context? Um, it would probably depend on the application and the year in which it arrived, how many applications we have. We also do a comparative literature panel, which often gets applications like that. Um, but we really look at the application to determine um, as best we can where the applicant feels he or she is making the best, biggest contribution. And so, for instance, if the CV shows that they've been doing a lot of publication in, say, Asia studies journals, it would go there. If it show, shows they've been publishing a lot in comparative, comparative, comparative literature panels, it would go there. It really depends on the application and um, 
what that what sort of leaps out from the CV and the application as far as where we think it gets the most the best possible review. Our aim is to get applications to the most sympathetic possible readers. Would you say there is a preference for projects that reflect a more perfect union theme? I see reference in other NEH prints this year. No, um, we very much like to see those applications, um, but they do not get preference in the review process. Um, the only real importance of those is that after we've decided who's going to get an award, we may dip into a particular pot of money to support those more perfect union applications, but um, it does not make any impact whatsoever in the review process. If our work is in a smaller discipline and non-US in scope, what kind to what kind of or review panel will consider it? Field is performance studies. Um, performance studies really varies where it goes. Um, sometimes those applications go to, uh, say, a theater panel. Um, others might go to comp lit. Um, it really depends on what we sense the project is trying to do. Um, again, why don't you drop me a line and we'll talk about how you might best position that because that's a really interesting question. I know creative project is not supported. If I am writing an academic book with an eye on making it a documentary, should I mention this or not? Um, do mention it. Um, you we will probably focus on the book, um, but the reviewers may be interested to know more about the documentary as well. But I would really concentrate on what the book dissemination is going to look like. Um, it's now three o'clock. So uh, how many do you have more questions there, Gwen? Uh, there's quite a few more. OK, um, I think we're going to wrap up here. Um, the. Um, I believe it's possible for how for us to get the email address of the people who have submitted questions. If we did not answer your question. Please drop me a line and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Um, and we will aim to answer perhaps some more in the um, application writing webinar that will come out in in uh, later this summer. But I think at this point we will wrap up because it is three o'clock. Thank you very much for joining us. Do let us know if you have questions and good wishes for your summer. <laughs>